Ken knows you. Ken is a great businessman. So we have another businessman here. David, the businessman, is missing. So. Well, we'll see. Okay. Now, was this the book I gave you? Is that the one I gave you? Or? Yeah, that's it. Was that yeah. yours? Yeah, you have it, sir. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, here is our material. All the wonderful books by Hannes, who is our main object. Do we have the papers? Did anybody write the paper for today? Or well, not yet? <laughs> you need to <laughs> <laughs> very enthusiastic. Uh, so, you need another week? Ken, I need my pills too, though, right? Eh? Yeah, okay. Okay, so we do it then next uh, next time. Okay, very good. Uh, do we... Okay. Now, tonight, we have the conspiracy. Last time, if you want to, we can have the conspiracy once more, but I suggest that we go over to to the pianist, which continues the uh, conspiracy. We see what happens then in reality. We can put that in, and uh, and then I thought maybe David. Is David here? Oh, David is here. So we need David. another chair. Yes, this one is here. Because we are multiplying. David. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Good. So, yeah, what do you think you want? Fine. Do you want to have the conspiracy yeah. once more, or have you enough of these guys? Then we can go to the other one. What do you think? The other one. Okay. <laughs> the other one. Put a Did you put the other one in there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have it already. Okay. Very good. We settled this. And then maybe someday we can also look at Sophie Scholl and some other things. Um, okay. And you have this book. And then you have also my manifesto. Right? Everybody has one volume. You have one volume. You have one, you have one? Okay, thank you. I have to eat my pills, and Dustin can entertain you in the meantime. <laughs> I think we'll get my black leather mini skirt by accordion. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. no. I went down to Food Dance. Oh, do you know Food Dance? It's a wonderful place down there. It's healthy, it's even healthy. You can eat a lot and you don't die. Very good. I have to um, have these vitamins there. Enjoy. So, do we have anything about the reading? Are there any questions about the manifesto? Or you are there? You have another one, right? That's our background reading. Do we have any questions about the background reading? Ken has not done this background reading. But that's okay. No, I haven't. David, you came in the right place tonight. On the right day. <laughs> oh, very good. I thought you would go to church tonight. I deserve to be Questions about the manifesto. One has the first volume, the other one the second, the other one the third. Any questions about it? So we, is it difficult? Is it easy? Why is it difficult? Why is it easy? Do we have any questions about this? No questions, but I can tell you something. Tell me something. You will write the review, right? I'll write the review of the, of the three. By the way, yeah. we have to close the door up there. I'll, I'll do it. Oh, okay, you're still here. Oh, okay. yeah. And you do have an article in that book coming out on the I do have an article. Well, what, what, what is it? I, I, I asked him if you had an article and what the title was, if you did, and he said, yes, you have an article. Oh, that's good. <laughs> well, did you put it in fast when you asked him? <laughs> <laughs> you can think, yeah. So. yeah. Okay, that's good. But then we have to put my things in order. I don't know anymore for what I wrote, what article, and so on. That is catastrophic. 
Okay, should we, um, is it okay with these uh, questions here, <coughs> or should we go on with this, or is it okay? So you have the chance either to answer those questions, or to write a paper on your background reading and your depth study, right? Is there still any question about our, um, mm -hmm. about our test? Do you have a copy of that? Yes. Yeah, oh, who, 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 oh you need it. Okay. So, then I have only one left here. Um, so we came there, in the test we came to our um, question number five, and we discussed this concept of the spirit or reason, because we are causing, talking about the pathology of reason, and we concluded that uh, the pathology of reason or of spirit or of will has something to do with two antagonisms in modernity. One is the one between the religious and the secular, the other one between the ritual and the collective. And so this is the source for we trace this back. There was an original unity, a relative difference uh, between the religious and the secular in the Middle Ages, but then modernity is only in the West. And then uh, it's uh, from a differentiation, it became hostile, antagonistic, discrepancy, and it went deeper and deeper, and this process continues today. People always have this illusion, no, now we have a big bang theory, and that bridges it all, it doesn't bridge a thing. So and now we have Obama, for instance, gave billions of dollars for brain mapping, that is another step in Galileo's direction and Darwin's direction and so on. So. That means the scientists move further and further away from all the religious positions, Islam, Christianity, and so on. These people think, the religious people think, we also appreciate uh, uh, reason and so on, but it's a completely, the modern reason is a very different one from what they knew in the Middle Ages or in antiquity and so on. So um, then, so we are in this antagonism, but we have a third step. Maybe there is a reconciliation possible, maybe a healing therapy is possible, and, but we have to be serious about it, because if we just um, have a phony reconciliation, that will not help and we stay sick. So then the other thing is the, um, there was a relative union mm -hmm. between the individual and the collective in the guilds and the family and the church and so on, but then modernity means, particularly Protestantism, that uh, the individual emancipates himself or herself from the church, from the guilds, from the family, and became more and more atomistic. That's liberalism then. Liberalism is an atomistic theory. It comes from Protestantism originally. And so by 1800, we said people felt very lonely and desperate to make all these decisions by themselves. And then many of them returned to the mother church, to the Roman Catholic Church. But then by 1900, uh, they didn't go back to the church, but to mass movements, like nationalistic movements or socialistic movements. So Jean-Paul Sartre, the um, existentialist, very extremely individualistic, needed a new He joined the Mao movement, the uh, Chinese communistic movement, and uh, other, it still uh, changed the Catholic Church, went to the Catholic Church. So um, we can see by um, the, what is this uh, fellow, the Jewish um, Jewish sociologist, the famous one, who uh, that was uh, the, um, the opposite of our of the German guy, um, Emil Durkheim. Emil Durkheim, uh, he has this book on suicide, which is still famous, and there you, he describes that to some extent. He finds out that Catholics and Jews have the lo lowest number of suicides because they have community. That means the individual is still bound into the synagogue or into the church. The highest suicide rate are the Protestants because they are most individualistic and the communities have become much weaker. My God told me, you know, the Catholics really have an identity, you know, but the Protestants are split into those many groups and a Methodist or Baptist doesn't have that massive identity like a Roman Catholic with this one and a half billion people behind him in that massive organization. So. There is a good study where the symptoms uh, can be seen. Still, uh, of actuality now, um, the uh, the book on suicide. Okay, so that was five, um, and we could go on there, but 
I think you, we, we did enough and you uh, can see what you want to choose, option one, answer the seven questions there, or option two, and uh, then write uh, some kind of a report about your reading of the depth study, of the depth study and of the, uh, and then we, let's have it the next time. And the quantity is not so important, so that is under 20 there, I think, no it's not 20. I don't know which question it is anymore. The uh, 16. 16? Okay, so let me just look at it for a moment. 16, give a critical summary of first step study. Yeah. So that is whatever you choose there, Hannes, or Sitzek, or so. And uh, you don't need much time for it, so this, uh, I don't want to mention how many pages you, you decide this. And then the 15, there, that is the critical theory of. Uh, um, that is the uh, background reading, a critical theory of society and religion there, whatever you read, and you will do it about this special book there. Um, any questions about your reading there? Okay, which we can, but we don't have to discuss that anymore. So, so let's just proceed in a normal way now. The test is behind us. Just give it to me. I showed you. This is from the Frankfurt Institute. It comes out every month. We can let that go through once more. You saw it already. And so they are alive and happy. And um, then we are today in discourse number, what is it? Discourse number five. Discourse number five. No, number seven. My God, this goes fast. We will not meet during the spring break, right? Which is not next week, but the following one, right? I think. Okay, um, in, uh, yeah, if anybody wants to go to the uh, congregation of Moses, tomorrow morning we will go there, so if, if you're free or whatever. What the connection would be is that the whole first generation of critical theorists uh, was Jewish, and uh, so the, I think the critical theory would not be thinkable without the Jewish background, however much it is covered up or whatever. But Horkheimer came from a Jewish family, conservative Jewish family, and so is Rom, and so is Marcuse, and so all of them. Um, Gurland, I think even Gurland uh, was, was Jewish, so the second generation is different. I mean Habermas and uh, Hannes are not Jewish any longer, so, um, but it has these Jewish roots, so the idea, and, and too, of course, the idea of justice and all this. Okay, um, what we, um, let me see what I have here. On March uh, 13th, then, we will have our second test. So let's get um, uh, finished with the first one, and then we will have the second one on the 13th of uh, March, then. Okay, um, yeah, then let's have some contemporary issues which we want, we want to connect always, our theme, we want to see the uh, um, illness and the therapy in real uh, terms. We discussed very shortly um, the uh, Kalamazoo Gazette article, but the last time we didn't have it yet, so let's very shortly um, look at that and then we have something else here, I think. Uh, so, yeah, this uh, that's I wanted to look to. So, um, first first discussion is on this article. It um, Pope resigns, Kalamazoo kind of theologians say courage and conflict motivate move to step down photo gallery and so on. So, Ursula really is the reporter down there. <laughs> what we see here is um, this is a secular society. Um, the newspaper is a Republican a monopoly. There is no uh, democratic paper, uh, counter paper, so which makes them sometimes more tolerant than, than they would be otherwise. Um, and so they called up because of this event uh, of the Pope there. And uh, it is interesting because suddenly a religious thing, which people usually are not concerned with, uh, enters, has access to the public sphere. The public sphere is between civil society and the state. Public sphere embraces, you know, the newspapers like this one or the television, 
bishop and the other one is me. Uh, so the bishop is Bishop Bradley here of the Catholic Diocese of Kalamazoo, which is part of the Detroit Archdiocese. Um, it is a very young uh, diocese. It came up uh, just it's just 20 years old or whatever. And um, I was here before it was founded. And um, so he was asked, and he said, the resignation of the Pope Benedict is another sign of his tremendous humility and great wisdom. So this is part of what we call a papal mythology. That means there are about religious people, sometimes a certain mythical atmosphere is created around them. They are somehow elevated. They are put on a pedestal in a certain way, and that is what the bishop has to do. The bishop is part of, uh, is in union with the bishop of Rome. There's Roman Catholic. There are other bishops here. Episcopalian bishop is here who is not in union with Rome. And uh, so that's a specific thing, and he always has to say something good about the, um, about the Pope, of course. Now, the critical theory is mythology critique, and the critical theory is also ideology critique in both cases. So from a critic, from a, our critical theory point of view, we would be a little bit skeptical about this tremendous humility. In what sense is this, is this humility involved there? Why? Because he says, I'm old, I'm fragile, I can't do it anymore. Is this the humility? Uh, they are always opposites uh, because it is such a tremendously high office. Therefore, to give it up freely, that is what makes him so humble, let's say for a moment. And then great wisdom. Why is this wise that he? Well, maybe because he's old and he cannot do the job anymore. He always called himself, I think he called himself God's donkey. He had to uh, carry the burden of the church and now the donkey he just can't do it anymore the burden has become so hot too hard and so, so but religious critics of the Pope such as Western Michigan University comparative religion Professor Rudolf Siebert uh, say the move could mo come as a result of the mounting pressures of a modernity weighing on Catholicism <laughs> so there are two solutions one is Pope, Pope's mythology great man, wonderful, white wisdom, and so on. The other one is a critical view um, that comes from us, and that's what the university, of course, should do, and um, the, uh, the mounting pressure. So that has to be explained. I, I had the hour, I had an hour-long uh, uh, discussion with the journalist, but it is very difficult to, uh, to, you know, to spell out every concept and, and so on. And then what came out, you know, is... Uh, it's pitiful in comparison to the work which went into it, but that is the issue, that religious things, you know, have a hard time to be expressed adequately in the, uh, uh, in, in the public sphere or the public square or however we want to call that. It's particularly Habermas who wrote his dissertation already on the public sphere, public square, and his whole life work up to the last things about uh, religion and so on, are all concerned with this public sphere. The language in there, the monopolization, and so on and so on. So that's very important. It goes right into our the practical application of what we are concerned with here. And, um, of course, the pressures. Where do the pressures come from? So if we use the critical theory of society, we know about this antagonism between the religious and the secular. <coughs> so the um, Church uh, um, somehow was on one side, the Roman Catholic Church. It is his church. It's the bishop's church. So that goes back long before Protestantism uh, arose. There was the, the Roman Catholic paradigm, and on the other side we have the attackers. So Giordano Bruno was burned. That is a horrible, a horrible event. He was one of the great first thinkers, and they just uh, burned him. Savonarola was something similar. Uh, extremely religious person, but at the same time also introduced individuality as personal thinking and so on. And Savonarola was also burnt. So, and they were both burnt by the Inquisition. And Ratzinger is the inquisitor of the Catholic Church. That means he became the head of the, con of the, um, of the congregation of the doctrine of faith. So that is the new name because the Inquisition sounded so bad Therefore, they call that now the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith. 
And so 12 years ago, 15 years ago, whenever it was, uh, he got that office. So, so we have uh, on one side the religious side, the Pope stands on the religious side, church on the religious side. On the other side, we have a modernity. And that happened the first time in, in the human species history. That, and I say species history because we know the difference between the critical theory and the traditional theory is that the critical theory looks at everything, religious or secular, in terms of the self-reproduction of the human species, not only of one civilization, but of the species. And I think we looked at the timeline uh, in which this self-reproduction takes place. The traditional theory has a blind spot. It does not look at, in, in those terms. So also, the human species is not aware to a large extent that it, it produces itself. So that people, when Detroit is now going bankrupt or unemployment, they think it's fate, fate's truck and so on. That means they don't understand that it is the world which they themselves produced which does that to them. Of course, not only the individual, but that the collective of the human species is struggle with nature, produced an economic system and uh, a cultural system and so on. Even religion is involved in this self-reproduction uh, which has the purpose of self-maintenance uh, um, self and self-preservation is the fundamental issue. So as man transform the uh, nature and the natural environment into a cultural environment, you see what's cultural environment there, the trees are even planted by me, that even the trees are part of the cultural environment. And as we transform the environment, we transform ourselves. We went upright suddenly, uh, uh, unlike other animals. We um, could look over for the savanna uh, grass, and our eyes, of course, were sharpen, uh, sharpened. The uh, female anatomy changed, the sexual position changed, the birth position changed. We did that all by addressing ourselves to food supply and enemies and so on and thereby made ourselves, we invented the tools and so on, and uh, to some extent our brain was given, of course, and was evolved together with the chimpanzee brain. They were similar, but by looking sharper, by making tools and so on, not only our muscles and our arms and so on, but also our brain was modified in the way, particularly part, the more modern part of our brain. And so uh, the, uh, everything, what we are, is the result of this self-reproduction, not individualistic, I am mating myself, I'm a self-made man, I'm Henry Ford, I did it all. The whole species works together in order to come to that moment where we are. That means all what we see in this room is immediate, that everybody can see, but it is also mediated. We are mediated through generations and generations of members of our species, and more specifically than here, the American civilization and so on, so that this tree there looks that way in that house and so on, um, on the basis of this total, total reproduction process of the human species. That is what the, uh, how the critical theory sees it, and a lot of these categories have been produced by Karl Marx, but they were there before by Adam, Adam Smith already, and the bourgeoisie had already a lot of these not so, so, so original as may, people may think. So, the, um, we, I think we mentioned very shortly that 10,000 years ago um, we uh, went further than just hunting and fishing, and, but these older types still stay with us, people still go fishing and so on, but it is not how people really make their living any longer. Um, you could say at the time of Mohammed, time of Jesus, we had already an exchange society, Mohammed was a, a businessman, but it was, they had money too, but it was on a much lower level of commodity exchange. In the meantime, the species had gone on and on, and we have an extreme form of commodity exchange. We can't even define our society as a commodity exchange society. And that's what we are. So that's why when Marx called the capital, he began with the commodity. The commodity was the key by which one can understand everything, because everything is commodified, even religion even art and so on, everything becomes uh, reified or commodified. So all this is part of this self-reproduction process, and Hegel's phenomenology of the mind was the basis on which the Marxists developed their own vocabulary. And so this is a completely different 
understanding now of everything what you can see is part of this reproduction process, it's the result of this reproduction <coughs> process, and it's the basis for the further, for the future development which will go beyond us. So, <coughs> okay, so in this context now, I try to, that means I try to make clear to the journalist that this uh, antagonism is there between the religious and the secular, and the Pope uh, took a, a certain position in that struggle. Already before he was Pope, uh, the students attacked him in Tübingen in the university. They said, down with Christ, hell with Christ, and so on. And the Pope was horribly uh, hurt by this, and he fled from the city and went to Innsbruck in Austria and wanted to retire, uh, write little books, and, and, and be you know, by himself. But then they pulled him forward to Munich and <laughs> into the Vatican and so on. And why? Now, this is what one where one has to dig and see the mediations. The Second Vatican Council uh, um, abandoned practically scholasticism, the medieval scholasticism, as a paradigm in which to encounter modernity. Now this is interesting for us because here in Toronto we had Maritain and the Neo-Scholastics, and these, from these Neo-Scholastics comes our medieval institute here in, in Kalamazoo. So, there was a period here, but Maritain was very famous, who used Thomas Aquinas again, reinterpreted him, and Thomas Aquinas gave answers to everything. And then in the Second Vatican Council, Thomas Aquinas moved into the background. It was obvious that uh, this model, let's see, this model, um, Thomas model, Thomistic model, was not enough any longer to encounter um, the uh, modern situation. The social and cyclic letters were still written in Thomas of Aquinas, that means in Aristotelian categories, but they had to bring sciences in more and more and more, and it was obvious that this uh, paradigm did not work anymore. So therefore they had to look for a new one, and this Ratzinger was a specialist for patristics. That means they went back from, the, uh, from scholasticism into patristics. Patristics means fathers, the church fathers. So one, there was the orthodox paradigm, and we had Originus was the Eastern, Eastern church father. He castrated himself, thanks to God, nobody followed him afterwards. So, but St. Augustine was the, the initiator of the Roman Catholic paradigm. So, therefore, now Ratzinger was, uh, uh, was a specialist for this, and they thought they could replace the Thomistic scholastic paradigm, which had collapsed, by the older one, a very substantial one, um, and there was something which spoke for this because the church fathers were enlighteners. That means they did not only read the Bible, but they knew also the whole Greek philosophy. Uh, they were trained in Pl Platonism. Many of them were Neoplatonists and so on. So, um, therefore, they, uh, at the time, they belonged to the Hellenistic Enlightenment. And so, therefore, one should think, you know, since they dealt positively with the Enlightenment of Antiquity, they could also deal ad adequately with the Enlightenment in modern times. So there was some logic involved in that. Uh, that is why he was promoted so massively, <laughs> because they brought the Polish Pope in, and uh, they, he, was a, 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 he was a very pastoral type of a guy. Uh, and uh, was very much people-oriented and also an actor and uh, could project himself nicely and people liked him a lot and so on. <laughs> but um, you know, philosophy and theology was not really his strong side. So the German bishops who put the Polish Pope in, they put right away a German behind him who would watch the doctrinal thing and that is how he became the, uh, the prefect, the prefect of the uh, congregation of the doctrine of faith, <laughs> and um, so so he had to watch over uh, what we can call what Habermas would call religion is the system of interpretation of reality and orientation of action. So, uh, interpretation of reality means dogma, and interpretation of uh, orientation of action that means morality and ethics and so on. So that is what he did in the two decades or so before he became the Pope. And um, the, during this time, and then also as a Pope, he um, t 
took a rather a, a strong religious vision and they called him our Taliban in, in Europe. That means the Taliban are, um, are a very uh, traditional group, or let me put it that way. As the antagonism between the religious and the secular deepened, the religious communities divided in themselves among those who stressed authority, tradition, and uh, um, identity, and other believers who wanted to have that too, but they also wanted to open up. There was a whole Christian paradigm under Schleiermacher, Professor Schleiermacher, a uh, colleague of Hegel, who uh, developed uh, um, an enlightenment paradigm in Christianity, where Christians wanted to be believers and they wanted to be enlightened at the same time. So that was the paradigm before the present one, which is the ecumenical paradigm. So, um, nevertheless, he took a very strong, um, I would not say fundamentalistic uh, position, but uh, rather aggressive as far as the modernity is concerned. So he, for instance, the Pope before him had said that uh, the Inquisition was probably wrong against Galileo and Galileo Galilei and uh, against Newton and against Giordano Bruno and was somehow willing to apologize for, for the shortcomings of the Inquisition at that time. When Rottinger came in, he said the opposite of it. No, Galileo was wrong in the whole thing. The, the Inquisition may have been right after all, he said. And right away he was thrown out of the university in Rome uh, all the natural scientists protested, rebelled, and he could not go there anymore. He had to stay at home. So that was uh, just one signal of many. Um, the uh, the most uh, damaging thing for his life was, and see the bishops doesn't say a word about all this. So was that as the inquisitor, he turned against the liberation theologians. The father of the liberation theologians, or the grandfather, if you want to, was, uh, was Metz, Johannes Baptist. Metz is mentioned down here. There's Küng is uh, mentioned, and Metz is mentioned. Uh, Küng is a uh, uh, center Hegelian, um, and Baptist Metz is a uh, Hegelian who is hostile to Hegel, like Marx was, and, and so on. So, um, Johannes Metz in the 60s demanded a revolution in which the injustices of civil society were to be overcome and so on. So many of the Central American and Latin American, like Gutierrez and so on, they studied under Metz. I brought Metz here. Um, he was here. I invited him through, not through Western. I invited Kung through Western, but Metz through K College. And uh, so he gave some talks here. And then he had a discussion in the morning with the Baptist ministers down there and got a nervous breakdown. Um, they, the, the questions which they asked were so idiotic that Metz didn't know what to do anymore. He wanted to celebrate the Mass for my wife up in Thomas More. He couldn't do it. He was just finished. And I said, just, just, you know, Baptist, this is all. I'm living here for 20 years already. I still have normal, you know, and you break down <laughs> after a few minutes. Like that. It's an insane place. I mean, a path of pathology. It's pathological, the whole place. But uh, that you fall, you know, collapse there because of a few Baptist ministers, this is too bad. Well, he said, I can't help myself. And so he had to sleep all day long, and at night he was sitting in the back and just looked at the Mass and didn't know where he was anymore. So it was a horrible, horrible experience for him. <laughs> so the, uh, and, and what they asked, you know, the first minister said, why are we on earth? <laughs> and Matt said, well, how should I know? <laughs> <laughs> So things like that, and one, one question after the other. I mean, it was so primitive, so backward, you know, so awful. Um, if one thinks, you know, the struggle in which he, Metz, was involved. But what struggle? No. He met um, one who was famous, and that was Carl Schmidt. Carl Schmidt came to his parish, Metz the priest, so he had a... On one side, he was revolutionary, and Moltmann is a, is a Protestant a liberation theologian, so old man said to me, he said, on one side, um, you know, he has these revolutionary ideas, and on the other side, he has that little godforsaken parish in Bavaria, you know, with, with the, uh, this, this Baroque uh, mass vestments there, you know, where you have two boards in the back and the front. So he walks around with this all the time, and 
uh, it cannot go well. And so Bloch, with another pretty good theory, it's a very important one, um, Bloch uh, uh, was friends with, uh, with, with uh, the thing there with the uh, Mets. Oh, and Mets uh, produced accidents for himself all the time. So he ran against a tree with his car. <laughs> he ran into another car and so on. And so he met Bloch once, and Bloch said, you know why that is so? Your superego is punishing you <laughs> for having these revolutionary thoughts. You know, this doesn't fit well, and therefore, unconsciously, you run against the tree because you want to punish yourself for, for these bad thoughts you have. So, nevertheless, uh, and I think it's true, after, after he was analyzed, he didn't produce accidents anymore. <laughs> But uh, until then, uh, after he knew the connection, it was okay. But there one, one day came to the mass Karl Schmidt. Karl Schmidt is the great Jewist of Hitler. And um, he was a genius. So uh, even those who are anti-fascists might say that he, you know, had deep insights into, into Jewish prudence. Uh, Jewish prudence, unfortunately, we don't have it on campus. We have a medical school now, and maybe we, someday we will have it. But even then we will not have it. Jurisprudence is more than our law schools. In our law schools you just learn past cases and you apply them to new ones and so on. Jurisprudence is a whole philosophy and a whole theology of law. So Hegel's philosophy of law comes close to it, but what uh, Carl Schmidt always mentioned was that many of the concepts of law are rooted theologically. And uh, so, uh, and he wrote also two little books, uh, Karl Schmidt did, Political Theology. So he was Hitler's uh, political theologian at the same time, from a fascist perspective. So uh, he was closely related with the great bourgeois thinker Hobbes. You know, and from Hobbes we go to, um, uh, to the uh, Machiavelli, and um, Machiavelli broke with the Aristotelian background. Uh, Aristotle and uh, taught that man was a homo sociale or uh, animal rationale or so on politicon, a political being. That means that we were destined to live in community. And uh, Aristotle, uh, under Machiavelli, breaks this. That means Machiavelli dehellenizes, a very important word. He dehellenizes, and Aristotle's peaceful idea that we are social and we want to have friends and so on, uh, then emphasized the, um, the selfishness, the individualism, the aggressiveness of one against the other, and then you have with Hobbes the war of everybody against everybody. That means civil society means the war of everybody against everybody. Everybody eats everybody. One corporation eats up the other corporation, and even the workers compete with each other and push themselves out of jobs and so on. So, um, so, so we have this tradition, Machiavelli, and then we have Hobbes, um, Hobbes Laviathan, that is the modern state, and the contractual theory. That means all these human animals who are selfish beasts and they want to eat each other up, they make a contract in order to protect themselves from each other. And that is that the state is nothing else than a contract which these atoms make because otherwise they are life would just be horrifying the, every moment somebody should shoot them and when you see all that shooting here that affirms of course what, the, uh, uh, what Hobbes had in mind and Hobbes also is the inventor of the concentration camp so not Hitler and Hitler took that over from the British uh, there was um, um, there was a city uh, where Waterloo University is there was a city which was called Berlin and then they changed the name into somebody else, a British general in South Africa, who the first time applied Hobbes' idea of a concentration camp. And they put the Boeren into the concentration camp and, and others and so on. So uh, Hitler got it from the British, and the British got it from their main thinker, their Hobbes. So it was all prepared. That is what we see when we look from the critical theory, right? That first of all, everything is in motion, the truth has a time core, the truth is historical, everything is historical, everything is mediated. That is an important uh, concept of dialectical thinking. So when we say Carl Schmitt, then we must say also Hobbes, and we must also say Machiavelli, 
uh, an adjustment to to this new modern idea, to modern civil society, and its horrible antagonism, which then ends up in liberal societies, fascist societies, socialistic societies. Also, Carl Schmitt <laughs> was based on a on a diplomat, on a Spanish diplomat, who um, uh, uh, shortly after the French Revolution, he thought that since the monarchies now fall and we have republics and or we have constitutional monarchs, therefore uh, uh, dictators will come about in order to take their place. And some of these dictators will come from heaven and these are bourgeois dictators of the third estate. But then there will also be dictators who will come out of hell and these, these will be dictators of the fourth estate. Now, what does the estate thing mean? That means here in this country, the third estate rules. The fourth estate is subjugated. The, uh, what the president in the union speech wanted to say, he wants to get as many people from the fourth estate into the third estate, so to give them the freedom of opportunity. If he would get all the people from the fourth estate, then we would have to ask who the hell will do the work but there are 200 million who do the work. That's the fourth estate. They have no representation. There is no worker in the Senate. There is no worker in the in Congress, and nobody even notices their absence. <laughs> that is the most important thing. One should say, you know, there are 200 million people who are disenfranchised. So that's the bourgeoisie and the bourgeois president who says, we give you one dollar more uh, minimum wage, and so on. You know, and they say hallelujah, and are happy for it, you know. But that is what the bourgeoisie throws, you know, to the people little pieces of bread there where they can chew on. You, you get now nine nine dollars, you know. And the CEO there makes three million a month, you know, and the other one he gets nine dollars uh, minimum wage. So, I mean, so the, the, see, the, the main thing in our discussion here is that the pathology is not even seen. That means the question is that the first time that one, first of all, can see that is pathological. Like like people, you know, have some mental problem and they don't even know that they have this mental problem. Or somebody has an alcoholic problem, says, I'm not an alcoholic. And so we say people are in denial. You have a whole nation here who is in denial about itself, about its very structure, an antagonistic structure, where there is not even a Labour Party, there is not even a Social Democratic Party, not to speak of a Communist Party or any party which could represent the 200 million, which is the majority. The majority is not even represented in the House, and, the, and, the, and, the, and that makes for the stalemate and so on, because one is socially modified a little bit through the New Deal and therefore wants to have a dollar more there in the minimum wage or whatever. And the other one represents the uh, not even the whole third estate, but only a small part of it, was percent or whatever, who control the the working class and the lower part of the uh, of the third estate and so on. So, so if we want to talk about pathology, our most difficult thing is to break through that appearance of normalcy as if that was normal. There's absolutely nothing normal about that experiment which we have made here, or are still making. Because from the very beginning, of course, the Constitution was a product of the Third Estate, of the Encyclopedists in France, and so on. And they couldn't, the Third Estate could hardly write, so they could not have done this evolution of the Constitutions without the help of the clergy. They were bishops who helped the Third Estate to write those things. And they were part even of the nobility who would help. That means traitors of their class who saw that the third estate was coming and rising and therefore gave them their talents and their monopoly of education and so on and helped them to write those things. And so, so. But those people, the fathers of the constitution, were all bourgeois. They were slaveholders. They did not include the slaves, of course, but they did not include the wage laborers, neither. Uh, and and uh, I mean, the uh, fellow there, who was it... Uh, Franklin, or was it Franklin, or the guy who, um, well, who was married to a black woman there? He Jefferson. Was hmm? Jefferson. Jefferson. Uh, he was not married, or was he married? And nobody no. knows. They had five children, and he didn't set them free, free neither. So, uh, so that the the first task which we have, and we still continue to do that, is to open our eyes up. If you remember.
remain in the traditional theory, it is not possible to see all that, and you just study, you know, what is immediately there. But if you move over to the critical theory, then you see everything in motion, and uh, you see also that because, and that's the dialectics, because the bourgeoisie developed these constitutions uh, it's, uh, uh, and, and uh, their thinking in their own self-interest, of course, and they excluded the fourth estate. Therefore, of course, the fourth estate from the very beginning rebelled, and we had the rebellion already in 1831, of which Hegel was so awfully afraid, and then we had the next rebellion in 1870, and then we had the next rebellion in 1917, and then we had then the uh, Russian thing up to 1989, and that will not be the last word, you see. Um, that people simply say, we don't listen to Marx, we don't listen to Freud, does not change anything about the reality of the third and the fourth estate. As long as the fourth estate is there, with or without Marx, there will be tensions, there will be rebellions, there will be shooting. And if it gets very bad, like we have this thing now with the austerity plan, if that on 1st of March goes through this austerity plan, we are Greece. It will be the same situation which Greece has. And then the unemployment will shoot up uh, right away. And, and the services will not be paid. And the firemen will not be paid. And there will be less policemen with the rising murder rate in Detroit and in Chicago, uh, less policemen and so on. So that is, this situation remains there if you have the categories of Marx or not. If you remain in, this, in the tradition theory or you go to the, to the dialectical one, <laughs> the only difference is that with the dialectical one you overcome your blind spot and you can see more. That's it. And if you see more, you can also p possibly do more about it, particularly to avoid uh, uh, violence and, and uh, outbreaks as we had, have it in Greece now all the time. And we don't have Germany here who can bail us out. So, therefore, we, we see what is going on right under our eyes in only a few days. It will be the, the 1st of March. And whatever the president will do at the last moment, the, uh, the two parties, and that's how the class struggle looks with us, namely that one represents, they don't want to, the others to pay taxes, the others don't want to give up the, uh, the uh, services, and so on. So, and that's why they sit there and cannot move forward, backward, and so on. In the meantime, the auto automatic stuff goes on and all these cuts will set in. Um, the military stuff is, is, is a minor issue, but it's all the services, and 10,000 teachers will be fired, and all this is uh, what's needed most. So, so <coughs> nevertheless, that we see <coughs> that it is a very different way if one operates in the traditional theory or in the dialectical one. That's what we want to make clear. It is only through the, through the critical theory that you can see that there is pathology at work. So Habermas and then uh, Hannes and so on use that word pathology of reason, that it is a sick situation. And you may have a lot of people, and maybe yourself, you may say, what's sick about it? It's not a sick about it. They, look, they do that like we always did and in Congress, and they behave the same way, and so on. And so one learns a certain normalcy, one learns that things happen again and again, so it must be normal. But um, the shooting is not normal, the killing is not normal, and what happens in terms of the uh, internal state law is not normal. In terms of external law, uh, the non-judicial assassination of 250 people every month without going to court not to go to an international court, not to go to a national court, and so on. All that is not normal. So that is what one what one can uh, can see to this. So let's go back to this whole thing here. Um, we have to presuppose, you know, the uh, dialectical process in which antag antagonisms developed, antagonism of classes, of the religion, the secular, of individual and collective, etc. And also a pope or religious, a secular person or government, whatever is embedded in these uh, tensions and these antagonisms. So uh, that is how I then uh, talked about the Pope here in the public sphere. So um, he uh, was put into this position because he offered something in a vacuum. The vacuum came about because the scholasticism uh, what became useless and was abandoned and there was nothing in its place. Here came somebody, but he came with some 
something older than scholasticism and definitely on a very high level. So Augustine was a genius, you know, so was Origenes and so on. And many of these church fathers, they were believers and they were highly developed in their philosophical and their scientific knowledge uh, through the Greek tradition and so on. So, and that is what made him attractive. And what happened now with his resignation is not only that he's old and fragile, because all the Pope down to the next last 600 years who died in office, they were all old and fragile and even sick or so, but they stayed in their office, that he did not stay. So it's my thesis is that his paradigm moved into a uh, uh, aporia, what is called by the Greeks. Aporia, A means negation, poria means way, no way. He moved into a no way situation. That means the pressures uh, in, uh, increased in such a way that it was not bearable any longer and he could not handle it any longer. <laughs> and um, that came in specific things again. Um, he, we have to admit, you know, that sometimes he tried to break out of his paradigm. So he gave a speech in Berlin, uh, which was uh, very positive about uh, the warming, global warming, and so on. Uh, he almost took the position of the Green Party in the German Parliament, and so on. So there was something like this. He also quoted in the last encyclical letter, Hockheimer and Adorno, and that never happened before, that the Pope quoted somebody who was not a pope. They only quoted oh. And there it was suddenly these two names there. Uh, another pope before had, had, uh, had already quoted Eric Fromm in an encyclical, in an encyclical which was Popolo, Progressio Populorum, about the progress of the people, in which the first time a pope suggested that a revolution may be necessary and may be legitimate, and that had never been said before and there from was brought in. <laughs> now, the question is, you know, why he, um, why he quoted those people. <laughs> the um, critical theorists are enlighteners, so they are in the tradition of Voltaire and Rousseau and Marx and Freud and so on, but at the same time they are also critical of the Enlightenment. That means they have learned from Hegel already in the very beginning that there was a dialectics of enlightenment. And there is a book which they wrote, Harkham and Adorno, The Dialectics of Enlightenment. It was written here, out of the experience of the American society, in, it was written in Los Angeles. What is the dialectic of enlightenment? <laughs> that means we have a dialectic between the religious and the secular. But then we have a dialectic in the secular, and we have a sec uh, dialectic in religion. That means, on one side, the dialectic, which uh, uh, enlightenment, which means to free people from their fears and to make them into masters of their faith, can turn against itself so that the enlightenment increases the fear and becomes terroristic, already in the French Revolution, and that it makes people more dependent than they were before. Enlightenment can turn against itself. That is what the dialectic of enlightenment means. And then on the religious side, it is also possible that the religion of uh, truth turns into mythology or turns into ideology. Ideology understood as false consciousness, as the masking of national and class interests, shortly as the untruth. Or that the religion of love turns into a religion of uh, witch hunts and... Uh, 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 persecution of non-believers or heretics and so on burning of Giordano Bruno and so on which all has nothing to do with love it's the very opposite so that's the dialectics of religion so that we do not only have good religion but that we have bad religion as well Marx attacked bad religion not necessarily good one but he attacked bourgeois religion and then the bourgeoisie said you say religion is opiate and so on that is what Marx thinks about religion. Oh, yes, he is an atheist. And so this whole swindle of the third estate and the third estate universities, then bourgeois universities, up into our sociology department, and so on, in terms of the traditional theory. So, um, but the enlighteners, uh, uh, then, who have their own dialectics, uh, discovered what bad, good religion is. The first time 
that opiate was mentioned, opiate religion was Kant, not Marx, not Hegel, two or three generations earlier. <laughs> and what was for Kant opiate or bad religion? It was a religion which consoled, but at the same time dulled the conscience. That means when you die, you call the minister in or the rabbi or whatever, and then he's supposed to console you and say, you know, you were a good man, you, you know, you will go to heaven, and so on and so on. But Marx said you should, up to the last moment, the minister should say, can you still make something good? Can you repent what you did with your marriage, what you did with your job, how you exploited your, your, your workers and all this, you know? So um, that means bad religion uh, makes people feel uh, comfortable or indifferent when they live side by side with the slums. Year after year, it's 50 years, I live side by side with the slum of Kalamazoo, which hasn't changed a bit, where people are just vegetating and cannot develop their ears because they have no music, they cannot develop their eyes because they have no painting, they cannot develop their hands because they have no jobs, and so on and so on. And there are 10,000 of them who live on the other side there. And do I, or do any people in St. Augustine, or in the synagogue where I go tomorrow, do they feel anything? Or we just called one million people we killed in Iraq, does anybody feel anything? No, nothing. 10,000 in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and so on. And we feel nothing. The, the uh, thing we have that with Mitchellich, I think we mentioned that, um, psychoanalysts who were together with the Frankfurt School after the war, and they were dealing with the German inability to, to, uh, to mourn, inability to mourn. Why don't we mourn that we have killed all these people? Why don't we mourn that we have urinated on the, on the Taliban's bodies, that we have burned holy Korans and so on? No, there was some not who did this. Also. We don't feel anything. We don't feel anything about the crimes of Vietnam. We, we just pushed well, it was our soldiers there. They did milai. There were hundreds of milais were done. <coughs> and one poor little lieutenant, he got a few days in, in the prison or whatever, and the nation as a whole feels nothing. On top of that, we burden those soldiers who come back, A, with that they have lost the war, and then, well, those crimes, they are in their dreams now. They have nothing to do with us. That's pathological. That is what psychoanalysis has to deal with, the inability to mourn, to repent, to regret. And if you say it, they don't like you anymore. Uh, if, if you say, for instance, you know, how can we change that? And I would say, well, if we would kill a little bit less, it would get better. <laughs> if we would lie a little bit better, it, uh, it would be better, you know. If we uh, I would steal a little bit less and what sin would get better, they, they would not invite you again anymore. Uh, they, they, have, they exclude you automatically and so on. So they make sure that no Mitchellich, you know, can disturb the quiet of their conscience. So that is bad. Uh, that is bad religion. <laughs> and now, uh, good religion can console the curse of finitude is on, on, of, is on all of us, so uh, therefore we need consolation. But a good religion would console and would at the same time sharpen the conscience. Now, Hegel took that from Kant, and uh, Hegel applied it to Hinduism, uh, because he thought that Hinduism, with this om, 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 and so on, instead of building bridges and uh, letting all the people sit in the slums in order to overcome that, so that means a religion which makes people passive uh, instead of uh, transforming reality and thereby themselves and so on. They just get stuck and say om, oh, om oh, all the time. <laughs> and then Marx took that over then from Hegel and uh, unfortunately I would say universalized it because it may not even be entirely true of Hinduism uh, but uh, one cannot, you know, without further proof or whatever suddenly say that all religions or whatever are opiate. But at the same time, he added to it that religion is the outcry of the oppressed creature. That means the religion of the poor who does that, or the religion is the heart of a heartless capitalistic world, you know, with the bottom line and so on. The insanity, so it, it, uh, it constitutes some sanity in the insanity of a late capitalistic system. And that was a very sharp insight. And I think we read the text, the text there by Marx, uh, where he, um, you know, where he does not criticize religion, not Jesus or whatever, but he criticizes bourgeois society, not following him. That is different, you know. Or criticizing the Jews, not, not Moses, but the 
Jews because they are not following Moses. Um, where uh, you know Marx would ask the bourgeoisie in London, you know, why do you make a liar out of him with every word you say and every deed you do? And so, so this is, and you see, we are so immersed, you know, in the bourgeois consciousness and the traditional theory. It's the only one which we know because they were effective in repressing the other. The critical theorists were here. If you ask, you know, what impact they had in our universities, well, the Ivy League colleges have an Ivy League uh, issue or whatever, but uh, um, otherwise, uh, it is, you know, when I look on online there and then they see, you know, they don't know from, they don't know Marcuse, they don't know other, they don't know anything, so they effectively have kept it back. And even when you see movies, and you see, maybe see one of them there of Moore, Michael Moore, you know, who really makes it simple now, you know, he shows Flint, he shows Detroit, he shows the disaster, you know, and he himself said recently on television it had no effect. It did not affect the electorate, they voted in Bush twice, you know, and could not do anything worse than that. And uh, um, so th that means the uh, traditional theory is deeply uh, rooted and embedded in the American conscience and consciousness and therefore certain things cannot be seen. If I do not have the category of surplus value in my head, then when my two cleaning women came from up here and I pay you $120 and so on, I would say, okay, I'll pay $220 and you work and you get $12 and everything will be okay. Everything is normal. The situation is sick because they, each of them gets $12 and $24. I pay $120, you know. Where does the rest go from $24 to $120? Well, they are surplus value. Who cashes it? He has even the coolie who does the telephone thing, you know, and, and, or, uh, or, and organizes it. So he lives in, in California, in, in, in Florida, there, and has a good time. And to get the, uh, well, he has to pay the gasoline, he has to pay the chemicals, he has to pay some taxes, and so on. Let's say half is cut out, he still has uh, $50 surplus value for every work they do, and they do four, four houses in the morning, and so on. That is sick! Do we see that it's sick? No. I tell that to my friends. They, um, I pay $150. <laughs> That's all. They, they may say, they are she did, it's too expensive. It's that. But the category of surplus value is missing, and they don't teach it Western uh, or anywhere in uh, economics or whatever, so that nobody can see it. If you don't have the categories or the network of categories, you cannot apply it to the facts which come through the eyes and your ears and so on. They are blind for it. And they keep blindfolded, folded, and uh, obviously very effective. Okay, so that was the about the Pope there. The 85-year-old Pope announced Monday he would resign, and so on. He announced the 28th he will resign next week. He is the first pontiff to resign in nearly eight, 600 years. Pope uh, Gregory the 12th, the last pontiff to resign, stepped down in 1515 and deal to end the Great Western Schism among competing papal claimants and so on. By the way, it goes through the whole, so, I mean, we want to see, you know, this is in the news now, that's in the public sphere, but uh, what really comes through, the filter, the filter, they use that word filter in the sociology department, what comes through the filter, you know, is, um, it is true, you know, there was a Gregory the Twelfth, and uh, he did resign in 1415, but what they forgot is that through the whole century, that means from 14 to 1500, uh, one pope resigned after the other. And what is more important is that none of them resigned voluntarily. That means one cannot even resign, call it resigning. They have been fired. They were fired. And by whom were they fired? By the council. So the council was much more powerful than the popes were. In the meantime, they have made sure that the executive, the pope, is much more powerful than the councils. And how did they do this? By 1870, they declared the infallibility dogma. The infallibility dogma means that the Pope is on top. He can declare without the council that this or that sentence is infallible, which gives him top and power up there. And the collegiate there, the cardinals and so on, and the bishops, they're subordinated under him who constitutes the council. So that means the, the, the Pope papacy was able, as if, for instance, our executive would get higher and higher do everything by executive order and push the Congress right into the shadow. That is what happened. So that means those popes, they don't say, talk about con it was called conciliarism later on. Conciliarism meant that the council was more important than the pope was. So since there were sometimes three popes and so on, uh, the council cleaned up. And uh, the last thing was 
during the Council of Constance, and that is the council which burnt Hus, another one was burnt. The council promised him, uh, that was the predecessor of Luther, promised him to come and he would, nothing would happen to him, and then he came to the council and then they did let him go home, but they burnt him on a stone which is still there, where, where the fire was and where they burnt him up, like Radana Bruno and so on. A lot of burning was got, including uh, uh, Thomas More there here, who also burned a lot of Wycliffe people, and so on. We don't even know the number, and so on. So this is horrible history, you know, this tower, and so on. And then in these things, that is all sifted out, uh, it's all left out. So the, uh, the things, the last thing, the last one who was fired by the council was particularly painful and shameful because that was John the Twenty Third, <coughs> not the last one in this century, the last century, but another John the Twenty Third, um, who came. And I told you the story. He came to Constance, and he thought the council would affirm him. So the council had the power to fire him and to hire him, and they thought he would keep him. At he found out that next morning the council would fire him too. So then he went back to his horse and fled into the Black Forest. And the council came together and they sent the police after him. They're there you see the difference between Pope and council. And the police caught him in Black Forest, dragged him to Constance, and then there was a trial and he was sentenced to five years hard labor and was sent to Venice where he, where he worked for five years there as, as a punishment and so on. So that is what the power of the council was once. And then in our century, there John the 23rd on Cali, who was the patriarch of Venice, the same city where this other John there, he called himself the first time John the 23rd again, because nobody in these 500 years wanted to, be, to use that name anymore, so shameful it was. And uh, then he did all kinds of things. The Pope had run away from the council, uh, John the Twenty Third uh, called in the Second Vatican Council and so on, so and called in the thing of birth control and so on and so on. So um, that was a moment of light then in the Vatican Council, and now we come to Ratzinger. Ratzinger was in the Vatican Council. He resisted every innovation <coughs> in the Council which was presented, including uh, the bishop whom we see there up there, where, where you see my wife there, the wedding day there. On the left side of him, that is Bishop Royce there. This Bishop Royce, he instituted, he wanted, he went to the Vatican Council and wanted to have married priests. <laughs> and they put him into prison. He was in the Vatican prison. Then they left him out again, and then he took another sign, and he wanted to have married deacons. Now, that got through. We have everywhere here, you have married deacons now. So, but uh, the other thing, that was, that was the press. So, Ratzinger was there too, um, and uh, he was, for one thing, he was for it, and that was reform of the liturgy, liturgical reform. But a year ago, he made another one, and he put all the texts back to the Latin Mass, which the Council had overcome. So even his innovations, uh, liturgical innovations, were backward, not forward, and so on. So um, the uh, 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 so nevertheless this uh, uh, this pope now he definitely was not fired by a council the council is uh, sitting at home where the bishops would have to come together and fire uh, nothing happened but <coughs> but the rebellion was there the pressure was there um, in the, on the secular side the articles like against outright war against modernity and so on one after the other. And then inside of the church, the opposition. So when half a year ago he came to Germany, 144 uh, theologians, uh, some of them, uh, with Arends was there, a friend of mine, uh, Poigert and so on. I don't know if Poigert was there. but And they gave him a reform uh, document, 144 <coughs> uh, theologians. That's a lot. They came from all the German universities. And so he uh, um, uh, got the document and the document had little reform things, really nothing substantial. But there was something, for instance, in the Roman Catholic Church, when you are divorced and you marry again, you cannot get to go to communion. When you get divorced, you can go to communion, but when you marry again, you cannot go to communion, and if you don't get an annulment. Another thing, they wanted to have people to, if they got married the second time, and it worked out well, and they took care of each other, then they wanted to give them the communion. Pope said no. 
um, then they wanted to have, there could be unmarried priests if they wanted to, but there could also be married priests, so the change of celibacy. That had been tried in the Council of Trent in the first year. For three years, celibacy was uh, cancelled in the Roman Catholic Church. But then came the Jesuit Counter-Reformation, as it is called, Counter-Reformation. And all of Germany had been Protestant already. Suddenly they pushed it all back, and it became Catholic again. And all the concubines were burned on the stake, and so on. For all the priests had their little concubine in, the, uh, in their parishes, and so on. And so uh, they also had the chalice at that time. The, that means for a thousand years the lay people didn't get the chalice. And uh, this uh, trend introduced it for three years and then repressed it again. And so now all the lay people can get uh, the chalice as well. So these are the little things. But um, that, that celibacy should be free was one of the reform things. That women could be ordained. <coughs> there is no reason why women should need be ordained. There's no dogma against this and so on. So the question why should it not happen? So a few things like that which are really not substantial really. Um, the the real substantial issue which the, which Ratzinger uh, was uh, caught up in is that about the class antagonism. That means these liberation theologians, they shifted from the church on the side of the third estate and before that on the side of the second estate, the nobility of the kings. Now on the side of the third estate, the Archbishop of Managua worked together with the CIA and so on against the socialists and, and all this. Uh, so the, uh, um, that issue is the core issue, much more important in communion than whatever, or, or the homosexual thing. By the way, that was another reform thing, that homosexuals should be uh, accepted and uh, also, I think homosexual unions, they wanted to have some blessings or whatever for their unions or the, was another thing. So, but the real issue is where does the church stay in the class struggle? And the class struggle goes through the whole reproduction process of the human species, at least from the change from hunters and food gatherers to farmers and the introduction of private poverty and so on. From that time on, we have just wars, just wars of quotation. From that time on, we have class struggle. And so, if you see the Gospels, there's no doubt who, on which side Jesus stands. You know, If you see the, the, uh, uh, the Old Testament, not Old Testament, the, bad word, the uh, Hebrew Bible was written by, uh, by rabbis and so on, and they were not poor. Um, the uh, the uh, wealth, according to the Hebrew Bible and so on, is okay. You can be wealthy, and God makes you wealthy. There's Job who was wealthy, and, and so on. So, um, uh, but the Christians are not middle class people in the Palestinian society. They come from the lower classes, and that is expressed, you know, in the source Q. There's an older source Q, a newer source Q. They have lost from whom then came Luke and Matthew, and, and so on. And there it is. No rich man can enter the kingdom of God. You know. There will be a camel can go through the little door in the wall of Jerusalem uh, before a rich man can enter the kingdom of God, and so on. So um, you cannot serve two masters. You will either serve capital or you will serve God. You, if you serve capital, you hate God, or if you love God, you must hate capital, and so on. So uh, all what form uh, calls the having attitude and the being attitude. So you have that being attitude, blessed are the poor, because theirs will be the kingdom of God, and then in, in Luke you have, and the rich have their reward already, they have nothing to hope for, and so on. So the whole mentality is entirely on the side, much more radically than in Judaism, is on the side of the poor. So everybody who says then that is a Christian and follows the teaching of Jesus and so on cannot be possible on the side of the ruling class. And that is what the liberation theologians did, and Ratzinger went against them. He called them to the Inquisition in Rome. Uh, according to the old Inquisition laws, you cannot even bring a lawyer with you. You cannot bring defense with you. Some of these liberation theologians brought three cardinals with them, and these three cardinals were not allowed to go into the chambers of the court. They had to stay outside while they were firing the guy inside there and so on. So a lot of these liberation theologians left the priesthood, left the church, and so on, joined the poor, had nothing to do anymore with the church. Um, one reason why Watzinger was um, uh, against that
them was that they could, their demand of equality uh, could be moved from the secular side against the capitalists and so on into the church side because the church itself has a class system where you have the uh, high clergy and the low clergy and the Pope on top of it and so on. So he thought that the critique would turn from the secular class system over to the religious class system and so on. And the struggle was furious and he did his best to destroy this. So, so all that is missing here. And I, I talked to the journalist with that, but that cannot be mentioned. So, Also, when, I, when we have the court, uh, Dustin is with me there, this course about letting go and, and so on. I wanted to mention names like uh, Hegel and Marx and Freud, and they didn't want to mention it. Then they mentioned it anyway. They did put it in the church papers but with some hesitation and resistance. So um, He is the first pontiff to resign, nearly, and so, so we have that. Bradley met Pope Benedict XVI twice, uh, while Benedict led the Holy See. Um, the first meeting was on a personal trip about five years ago, and they met again last year. So that means nothing personal trip. Bradley, bishop, has to go to uh, to every five years. The, uh, every bishop has to go to Rome and has to give a report what is going on in his diocese. And so he went there five years ago and then went recently again, so that was, was his meeting there. Um, and then it goes on. Bradley said, uh, yeah, it was a personal trip uh, five years ago, and they met again last year when Bradley and his fellow Michigan bishops traveled to the Vatican City for this Quinquinal, it's called Quinquinal something. Um, the distinction uh, was he was more vibrant a few years ago, so that's the thesis he was old and therefore had to retire. Bradley said that he was noticeably frailer. I think it was a decision he made after a lot of prayers. Uh, of course, what does that say? It is courageous in the sense that he is doing something that hasn't been done in modern history, and it's because he is looking to what is the best thing for the church and so on. Well, it is it is somewhat curious that somebody so conservative does something so unconservative. That is really, uh, in a certain sense, astonishing. Siebert, um, it Pope Benedict formally counted to the founding of Siebert was a professor in Germany. Uh, in 1962, Ziva is also friends with the Pope's more vocal critics, including King and Baptist, that is true. And then the Catholic theologian also shares much in common with the Pope, as they both grew up in Germany under Nazi regime, served in the military, and taught as college professors. So uh, the, they forgot that we both were in the Hitler Youth, that the word Hitler was too bad, just couldn't be used there. And uh, so the Pope always said he didn't go to this, but every German had to go Wednesday and Saturday, and otherwise you were punished. And so I was punished sometimes. And then, uh, then uh, military, he deserted, and uh, I don't know how, what reasons he could have to desert, um, because you can desert because your government is delegitimated, it's so criminal, so, but. Um, who knows that really? Uh, government is uh, legitimate when it's recognized by other nations. Hitler was recognized even by the Allies to the last moment, even after his death. His successors uh, were recognized. Goebbels was the next chancellor, and uh, then uh, the Dönitz, the uh, admiral, uh, was the next German government, and they were all, it was a continuity, continuity of recognition. So there was no illegitimacy as such. The crimes which they committed were not entirely clear. Uh, the concentration camps were known, but they were not known as death camps, for instance. The horrendous crimes, you know, for which everybody was blind, was that he started the war. He started a war of revenge against the West and a war of theory against the East, like Bush. Two wars uh, he initiated, so uh, this, that is a crime. That's an international crime. And because of that, I didn't want to serve the Air Force, but they came the next day and said I had no choice, and uh, so I had to do this. And <laughs> while I was forced, I was nevertheless willing to do it when I saw that Frankfurt was bombed out next day, and people were butchered and burned there, and the tar with napalm and so on, and I thought it would make sense to defend them, and so I did forced and voluntary at the same time. But never did I uh, desert because I didn't know exactly when I was free from my oath. Maybe I should never have taken an oath. But after you have taken 
one, you are bound to your oath. And uh, so I then I fought and I surrendered to Patton. Uh, so sometimes government officials resign when the pressure becomes unbearable. That is my theory. So he has had one crisis after the other. I said, with child abuse scandals worldwide, there was a report here, by the way, yesterday for two hours about these child abuses worldwide. They thought it was only America. Then they thought uh, the United States. Then they thought it was only Canada. And then it was all over Europe and all over Africa and so on. So um, I, I didn't want to stress this, but this is uh, um, he played in a, in a strange role in this, and uh, uh, we can say something short about it there. Um, uh, these scandals there, his involvement in these scandals was he uh, in in the whole uh, um, authoritarian, it's an authoritarian church, in the totalitarian church. They made under him a law that all child abuse cases had to be sent, uh, the papers had to be sent to him, to his office. That means he knew about all these thousands of child abuse cases in his office and somehow declared himself responsible for it. This is when you concentrate power you know, in one office, then you have this unbelievable responsibility. So, and how he behaved there, he behaved according to the canon law, which is the law of the church with about 1,800 or more uh, canons. I had to learn them by heart once. That was awful. The Father Ken also had to learn. He became mentally ill when he did it. So it's a, it's a Roman law. It is very rational and, and so on. So he applied that. And, and the fundamental tendency of this uh, law is that the church courts should deal with those things. So he sent a letter to the Irish bishops, they should not uh, volunteer, uh, you know, to the civil authorities about it, should keep it for themselves, and uh, horrible misery came about in, in Ireland about it. <laughs> but the, um, there is also a certain solidarity between the clergy, it is a certain selected class of people who have to stick together in order to keep their power going, and so on. So, but I think some more human elements too. So I think I told you already, there was a priest here, I think in Wisconsin or whatever, and he had these child abuse cases and uh, had child, several child abuse. And the bishop wanted to defrock him. And uh, Ratzinger said, no, don't defrock him. He's young, he's only 30 years old. Don't ruin his life and uh, try again. And so, so the bishop tried and he had another child abuse. You know, so Some of these guys have 100, 200 child abuse uses behind them. And so then the bishop said, that's the end. I think I, I fire him now. And so he was fired. And then he married. And while he was married, he had child abuse, practice child abuse. And uh, then he was put into prison. And after years, he came out of prison. And there was no wife anymore, no church and whatever. So it's a horrible, horrible disaster for, for that. So he wanted to prevent this. So this is a human element which one somehow should appreciate. Maybe one should think more of the victims than of the perpetrators and all of this, but that means he, uh, he and many bishops uh, failed in supervising and take adequate measures. <coughs> but what is an adequate measure? The church always put people into a, into a monastery. So a year monastery, I was once in a German orphanage and that happened. The head of the orphanage abused the children and so the bishop came and he took him out and <clears throat> the priest wanted to work in a mine as a miner in order to repent for his sins and so the bishop sent him to a monastery and he had to stay in the monastery but then they thought when they pray hard and fast and so on then it would be okay and then they sent him to another parish and then they did the same thing. <clears throat> but recently, you know, where science comes in, they send them not only to prayers but they send him to psychologists too. And then very often the psychologist said, the guy is healed now, you know. So then the bishop reassigned him again, and of course it did the same thing again. So <coughs> that, you know, it's a shady thing about guilt and responsibility and so on. So, um, but the press, of course, you know, the secular press also has its own enjoyment, you know, in the, uh, that uh, the more, the smaller they can make the church sovereignty, the better they feel. And so uh, there's something to that too. <coughs> so that about the what it is really you know in terms of psychoanalysis homosexuality um, first of all 
the homosexuals do not like this when they are identified with this and we have to listen to that but I from my experience and I have been you know for many decades in the Roman Catholic Church <coughs> I think that um, a non-married celibate uh, uh, priesthood is not really attractive for normal uh, sexually normal people I mean somebody for 25 years they don't take a vow, a vow they don't take the vow of chastity you only do that when you go to a monastery so they take a, they make a promise they make the promise not to get mad but who is 25 years of age when sexuality is still in the process of developing and so on knows how he will feel when he is 40 or 50 not to speak that at any moment he could meet the right person and whatever many times you go on for 50 years and don't find the right person but nevertheless suddenly it happens you know so and I was sitting with um, my friend uh, King there whom they mentioned here we were drinking wine at the Rhine River, uh, Rhine River and there came a messenger and he said uh, uh, talked about the young priest who had uh, had killed himself and because he had his promise and he met somebody and he couldn't deal with it so he killed himself and I had shortly before that in Meshed where I taught the same thing in the Christmas night a young guy um, uh, killed himself uh, hanged, priest hanged himself during the Christmas mass up under the tower of the cathedral of Meshed and I even know who knew the woman in whom he was in love with whom he was in love and his father was in love with the same woman and it was a complicated thing and so on but Nobody, I mean, it means to test providence if one uh, makes such a promise when one is 25 years old or whatever. So, uh, therefore, the reforms which the students wanted, uh, which the, uh, my colleagues, the 144 in Germany, wanted to bring in, they, they would be very good if one would make it free. <coughs> so, but um, I think now, and, and that is an opinion and uh, meditative theory, I have it in the family, one of my sons is a homosexual, but um, these child abuses are almost all male. That means male, priest, and then a boy, a boy. There are a few girls here and there, but most of them uh, are boys. And I think what has happened, that homosexuality was, of course, open in Greece, in Sparta, in Athens, and so on. Um, the Spartans even had the idea that two homosexual lovers would fight better. They would defend each other in battle and so on. So they had, didn't have our problem about homosexuality in the army or whatever. And women were fighting too anyway. So so that, um, but then Socrates had Alcibiades and, and uh, publicly everybody knew he had that boyfriend. And the idea was, you know, that uh, the beauty uh, they couldn't see, they were blind for the beauty of women. So they were, they could see uh, beauty only in males. And the swimming pool, they all bathed nakedly, uh, including women, men and women together in Athens. And, uh, but they couldn't see the beauty of the women. They could only see the boys. And so you, uh, you learned about the beauty in one person, but that was vacillating. Sometimes he looked beautiful, sometimes he didn't. And, so then you wanted to have beauty itself, eternal beauty and so on. And when you had reached this, like Socrates did, then he didn't touch Alcibiades anymore. And that was considered to be normal. And since it was all open, it was also regulated. That means the age was made clear and what could be done, what could not be done, and what was uh, rape and what was not, and so on. But since Christianity and Islam and Judaism repressed the whole thing and put it in the underground, therefore there are no rules but it's just bad. The whole thing is bad without differentiation. And uh, therefore, this child abuse then uh, is, is totally bad because we don't have anything good. We have no institution of how to, how to settle this and so on. So, um, and therefore, if it is true, you know, that homosexuals are, that there are proportionally more homosexuals in the clergy than in the rest of the population, then something would have done about this and, and to, to set it free would be one thing but uh, uh, so that we can be married or not married and then also that homosexual uh, friendships you know could happen I think 
But the reformed theologians, they have wanted that if there are two friends, homosexual friends, they will have two lesbians living over there who took care of each other and then went to Friendship Village and so on. So it becomes more and more friendship where they care for each other and so on, that this should be somewhat recognized and, and, and so on. So, <coughs> so this, uh, uh, well, that was one thing, but it was not these candles alone. Nothing has said they were horrible these things. So he condemned them, he uh, apologized to the victims and so on, but um, the victims demand more. Uh, they wanted him to open up all the archives and to open the whole thing up to the civil authority. That means practically to cancel the whole uh, whole canon law uh, and it hasn't happened in these seven years. So uh, the Pope expressed his saw about it but he did not take the necessary steps. And, uh, and that is in other cases too. He uh, visited the Pope in Alexandria and they kissed, but um, he did say friendly words about the Archery of Canterbury and so on. But it never went any step further. Further what? That he would say, look, I'm the first among equals. Then all the other seven patriarchs would be with him. They would recognize him that he is a little bit more because Peter was there in Rome and so on. But he would be the first among equals. He cannot say that. Equals. He cannot say equals. And therefore the split went on in spite of, you know, nice gestures and so on. So um, as far as this legacy, as we call that, the legacy, um, there are uh, this is a lot of sad stories so far. <coughs> okay, so, uh, but the main thing is now, uh, so we don't have to go see what the, the Pope's inability to see the secular side <coughs> on popular issues, including the role of women in the church and abortion and homosexuality has created culture war. Uh, well, in reality, there are culture wars going on all the time, and the question is what position one takes in these culture wars. And he has taken a very rigid type of a position, which of course sharpened the culture wars, and then you lose it at the same time. So there are already seven states now, at least, to have homosexual uh, homosexual marriages or uh, some kind of partnerships or whatever. Um, but it goes also, you know, with by 1880, no state had divorce. In the meantime, every state has divorce laws including Italy, the Catholic states, including France, including Spain, including Ireland, and so on. And so step by step, when you look at the legislative process, process, you'll see that the secular side wins all the time in the long run. There are little skirmishes, little things where they may win for a moment, but then three months later uh, it goes on. So if one has this type of experience for a long time, one should not repeat it again, you know. Uh, insanity, pathology, is when you uh, use the same means and you expect different uh, results. That is insanity. So we have uh, another example here of the pathology of reason, which is which is at work. It is on the secular side and it's on the religious side as well. <coughs> so um, then, so well, what is it, women and such and so on. He said. Uh, in, in what sense, you know, is that secular? Of course, the emancipation of women is a secular affair through the 19th century and so on. But there were things, you know, Hildegard from being in the movements inside of the church and the monasteries where women did, you know, fight for, uh, for emancipation and also became very aggressive sometimes in the critique of the papacy and the clergy and so on. By the way, when this letter went around here in, in Kalamazoo, the nuns were the ones who congratulated me of all this. So the nuns are much more um, progressive than the males are. And they were hit recently by the Pope sent a commission here and they looked over and they made a document and it was very critical of what the nuns do. And I know what they do and how devoted they are, you know, day and night. They know that the present generation is lost, you know. So they have pizzas, pizzas all over the place and dancing and uh, whatever to get them in this last generation and so on. It's, uh, they over, almost overdo it, you know, uh, in, in their devotion and so on. And then I was in Marinol. I taught the nuns in Marinol every summer in the 80s or so. <coughs> and I saw there were how, um, how enlightened the nuns were. 
Uh, even here, the, the nuns here in Kalamazoo, the sisters of St. Joseph, mm -hmm. there are 80 of them, and they all have their doctorate. And before many of them are dead now, before they died, they all inherited their brain to an arbor, to the hospital, so they could study Alzheimer's and so on. So they are, you know, very progressive. Everything. And when I was in, in, uh, in New York, there were nuns, you know, male like nuns, I must admit. But they celebrated their own mass. No, they didn't care about it. They just celebrated the mass, like the priest does and uh, was not permitted or whatever. According to the church, that is a Missa Sika, a tri-mass. So um, every Protestant who celebrates, you know, the Last Supper or whatever here, also Anglican priests, they all celebrate a tri-mass. It's not valid. Bread is bread, wine is wine, nothing happens to it. Um, so that was the case with the nuns too. But they tried, nevertheless, again and again. <coughs> um, so and and then they were very courageous in terms of going to El Salvador and uh, you know to uh, to Central American countries and many of them didn't come back. They had uh, a horrible dilemma um, <coughs> in this building. They were up on top. They were the older nuns who were dying naturally. In the middle, they were all the nuns in their forties, fifties who had cancer and dying from cancer and nobody came in from below there. But uh, my task was to uh, prepare them to go into a socialist country, or a country in which they were socialists, because they didn't know what that is. That's another thing, you know. Because we don't know what socialism is, we don't miss a socialist party. We don't miss anybody who represents the 200 million or whatever. So, so I taught them, you know, what that would be like and how they could talk with them. Um, and uh, then uh, when they came back again, they were supposed to go to their parents and stay with them for four weeks. You know, they emphasized family again, the nuns. And, uh, but then they came after three days and said, I cannot talk with my, my relatives anymore. Every word what they say, they say, it's not true. It's not true. What you, what you saw there and uh, somewhere in El Salvador, you know, where 72,000 people were killed by the Arena Party the fascist party there, and then Romeo was killed, and uh, two of the nuns who were killed, of the five who were killed and raped, they were in my class there, and uh, so, um, but they went, anyway, they went again, but they couldn't stand it at home anymore. There you have this thing, you know, this type of uh, conservatism, this, you know, denial of all the things which the country is involved in and this not being able to mourn and so on was just horrifying for them. So I had to try again to make them patient with their fathers and mothers and talk with them lovingly and why they couldn't understand it, you know, because this whole thing is under a curse or whatever. So you cannot, they don't get it. So and but one shouldn't now hate father and mother or whatever because they can't stand it or the uncles or the aunts or whatever and so I tried these two things there but uh, no less the, uh, and, and so they came you know last week there in the mass and so on and they were very happy that this came about And but the question is now you know the, that's the diagnosis what the Pope knows it is Bishop Bradley said the Pope took a deliberate approach what in God that of course deliberate leading the Catholic Church and didn't miss a beat, well I would say miss, miss every beat which was possible by traveling around the world and writing extensively so well he has written two Jesus books by the way and they're all patristic so it's all in, according to the model of the church fathers and uh, if we say now you see, the church lost that uh, scholastic model and then wants to replace it by a patristic model and that failed now too. That is what the resignation means. That another model failed. We have to offer a new one, you know. And my suggestion has always been that uh, with Karl Barth, namely that Hegel should have become the Thomas Aquinas of the Protestants. And uh, I would even add, you know, that he should have become the Thomas Aquinas of the Catholics as well after Thomas Aquinas was not valid anymore. That means that the church should shift, you know, into, and, and take a lot of question, you know, on all things, and at the same time, summed up practically the philosophy of 6,000 years. They could not have found anything better whatsoever, but they studied him, you know. Uh, you have, by the way, you know, Catholic universities and so on are most open for the critical theory and for this type of Hegelian tradition. So we have been invited to go to Rome there in May, I can't make it, but uh, 
Chicago uh, University, there, you know, Yola University has a place in Rome and has invited people to study the critical theory of, of religion. So, so some of them got it, you know, but not enough to, uh, to uh, make a paradigm change. But it is not so, you know, there is no alternative, uh, either scholasticism or patristics or nothing or so. There is a great tradition, and they would include, of course, Marx and Kierkegaard, you know, and the Frankfurt School. They're already quoting them, so, um, but to drag the masses of people, you know, into that, but at least, you know, to make it available for the clergy uh, would already be a, a great advantage. I mean, you have no idea what that looks like, this clergy here, you know. I, I'm supposed to go to visit to them, and so on. I went once, you know. And then I got as sick as Metz got. Um, they discussed, you know, what would happen to them if they found out that they were buried in the Protestant cemetery. I, th I said, w do you really, would you really mind <laughs> to wake up, to, I mean, to be buried in a Protestant cemetery? What would that do to them? <laughs> The worms are the same in a Catholic and a Protestant monastery, so there is absolutely no difference. But I, I mean, idiotic forms like this, like the Baptist minister, why are we on earth or whatever, you know? The questions already are so otherworldly that one doesn't know what to do with them, really. So I, I just couldn't do it anymore. So I just, then another time I said Jesus was neither a king nor was he a priest, you know, and at best he was a prophet and so on. As a matter of fact, he hated the guts of the Sadducee priesthood, and they killed him in the end. Oh, they all started out, no, he was a priest. I said, what kind of a priest is it? The whole priesthood died out at this time. And it was disastrous, the whole thing. So whatever one touches, you know, and so the priesthood, the priests there um, are in a, in, a, in a pitiful way, and it's, it's bad for them, you know. One should not let people... Uh, it in, in such a situation there. Um, I mean, celibacy is only one one thing, but but their whole mindset, how they have been trained and so on. They they had this priest here. What was his name there? This guy there. Rico. So Rico, yeah. We finally threw him out. He's gone, you know. Is he? Yeah, fine. He was that priest who was a homosexual and was a minister, and then converted to Catholicism and came. The priest, he has the Acton Institute in, he went back to this Acton Grand Institute Rabbit. Yeah, in Rabbit. And he wanted to bring Catholicism and capitalism together. And so one day he said he wanted to ass assassin, one should assassin Chavez. Chavez had just returned with his cancer. Uh -huh. to, uh, to, um, to he should be assassin so then one could save a war and it would be cheaper and so on and so and I wrote to the bishop, I said, no, we, I don't know anything about the New Testament, about the assassination of Chavez or anybody else, you know, and the canon law also has no canon which would permit this, and uh, so the Decalogue also the Seven of the Mountain, so how can we say something like this? And the Protestants, had, he learned it from the Protestants, you know, the 700 Club, they also wanted to assassinate him. So then the bishop wrote back, well, he's not sinning anymore. He meant he doesn't do homosexuality. He's homosexual. I said, I'm not interested in his sinning. He can sin to doomsday if he wants to. <laughs> but I'm interested that he wants to assassin Chavez. And that is not a Christian thing to do. So, so then suddenly he appeared and disappeared now. So uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. But now he's up there in Grand Rapids and does the same thing. So, but that is only a side show here. It was for, for the Catholic theology and they had trouble with the user. So, okay, we said that already. So Bishop Bradley said, uh, what else does Bradley say, say, say there? Um, he said something very important here too the, against him and he was deeply shocked. He was that he went to Austria. That, that is, you know, with this youth movement, he had this encounter there and it hurt him deeply. Bishop Bradley said the Pope had delivered so and by traveling around the world we had that he made note that the Pope announced his resignation on the day <coughs> of the feast of Our Lady of Lourdes. Now what this resignation has to do with Lourdes is unimaginable. Lourdes does not have to be believed by any Catholic. It's not a dogma. So you may or may not believe that Mary talked to the girl or not. <coughs> There was another thing, metagogy, you know, a similar thing, uh, where also uh, uh, meta 
possibility. Also, may I talk to Joan and so on? And it's now a big business center and so on, but nobody has to believe in it and so on. So why why that resignation has something to do with dirt is not entirely clear. And then the world day of the sick, the Pope is not sick at all. He's just old and fragile and so I don't know what 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 they want to say there. He also said that the Pope was well over the age of retirement when he became the pontiff at the age of 78. Well, the Pope obviously knew that, so why did he make himself a Pope? Let himself be made a Pope. Finally, address the significance of the day during a mass on Monte Borges Medical Center. My daughter is there, the director of these nurses there. Lourdes is a place in France where people 150 years ago went to bathe in special waters for healing water, Bradley said. The fact he recognized his own human condition, his limitation as his role as Holy Father today is important. And the bishop is not even bothered by this word of Holy Father. Because in the New Testament, Jesus says very clearly, don't call anybody good, only the Father in heaven is good. Don't call anybody Father, your only Father is the Father in heaven. And so do they care about it? So the question would be how to reform the curia in terms of the Gospels. That is the solution. And the solution comes from from Eric Fromm would say, if somebody wants to remain Catholic, it's okay if he can do that honestly, but he should mobilize the humanistic elements in Catholicism, and he should ask for the reformation of the curia bureaucracy, bureaucracy uh, in terms of uh, uh, the Gospels. So, so that's what I always have done and what I continue to do because this way obviously it does not work we, uh, that shows clearly it's not that the Pope is sick or has to go to Lourdes and drink holy water or whatever uh, the issue is how uh, he can be how that can be reformed according to the gospel and that what he did in, he opened up a new school for diplomats in Castel Gandolfo um, the Vatican state is a state but it's not a real state and who has created it? Mussolini has created it. Mussolini's Lateran Treaty. Uh, the Pope recognized fascism, and the fascists allowed him to sit in that little state. It has no real, real army. It has does not procreate. They are only accidentally. They are all celibates, so they are not supposed to procreate. So uh, every other state procreates and so on. But it has a uh, it has a diplomatic core hundreds of nunci, uh, which are in different capitals and so on, and all the martyrs of the Second World War with Bonhoeffer and others um, asked, you know, that the Pope would stop that whole diplomatic thing. He only got in trouble. He had the Lateran Treaty with Mussolini, and he had the Empire conquered that with Hitler, and, uh, and the Jews were not rescued, and the Christian martyrs were not rescued either. So that is where the way is to uh, intellectually in terms of having a new logic, a dialectic logic, and not following uh, the uh, traditional theory uh, would be one thing, and then a reform in terms of the Gospels uh, would be the, the right way, but is there any chance that this will happen? No. <coughs> not in terms of, you know, science and sociology and so on, because the predecessor already made half of the Cardinals uh, conservative like himself and this one in the last seven years appointed the other half and they are also all conservative so by all normal mathematics they will bring a conservative in there is a cardinal in Africa who emphasized the class issue is on the side of the poor and all that so that could make a difference but it would be a miracle if they would bring him in not because he is an African but because he uh, has this identification with the poor, as the Gospels do. And uh, that's why they would not let him come in. <coughs> By the way, we met him. He was, in, um, he was in Notre Dame when I was there. And he said they would change that in terms of uh, Romero, because Romero has been completely ignored. He died for the church. He was a martyr. He was killed by the, uh, by the fascists. And um, but uh, this uh, uh, n so far nothing has happened so I don't think that they have the numbers in order to make that change and what will happen then well the uh, dichotomy will get 
deeper and deeper. Uh, the church will be pushed out more and more out of the public sphere. In a certain sense, it eliminates itself from the public sphere by not finding the right words, the right language, the right logic, and uh, so it will be uh, the suffering will continue. <laughs> so when we look around the world, the common factor we find in the United States and in other parts of the world is there may be a decline in people awareness and God himself probably said that that's true up so there's a secularization process going on. And the question is we well, cannot even talk about stopping it. I don't think it can be stopped, but uh, what how one relates oneself to it and uh, if an outright war against this, like the popes did, the pious popes did in, 19, in the 19th century, there was a syllabus against everything modern, and uh, somehow this pope went back to that line, and that is not the right approach. So one thing this resignation teaches us, us that, that an old model, uh, in terms of the tradition theory, will not help any longer. If they put one in with this model, then the suffering will go on. Thousands of Catholics have left in Europe, thousands have left here, and continue to leave. Um, but that will continue if they bring another guy in. And I would not even say conservative or not. Somebody in who does not come with the scholastic model, who does not come with the patristic model, but who comes with the modern model. Modern people think differently. The new logic has not appeared accidentally. Uh, up to 1800, we all have the Aristotelian logic according to which the Church is still thinking. And we and Western do, yeah. But um, the future belongs to another because the society is so unbelievably contradictory that only a dialectical logic can deal with this adequately. So, Rudy? Yeah. It's uh, almost 8.30. Okay. Do you want to have a short break yeah, and do the break film? In the film, yeah, right. Okay. And uh, did we say the film which we want? Is this uh, yeah. pianist, right? Okay, so how about cookies? Did we have cookies? Yeah, they're here. Oh, oh, please take the cookie. We have water. Do you have water? Okay, see if you no, can do it, you know, with the paper. That Appreciate we can have that for the next time so that we don't get too close to our new test. Then. And just try. Don't be discouraged, right? very simple, just express your own feelings, say this was very hard to read but then say why it was very hard to read say, you know, there are so many words which I didn't know, or because of the logic of it and then we can explain it a little bit and can see, you know, for you and a little bit Rudy, yeah. from that article, I... Um, Did you have it? You got it, right? Well, the, you just quoted some of it. Yeah. Uh, Did you read it? Just uh, briefly, yeah. a little bit, on my cell phone. Oh, okay. But, but you uh, have it. If somebody wants to have it, I have a copy here. But one thing I, uh, you were talking about, it seemed that you were critical and suspicious and... Uh, about Ratzinger's uh, honesty, yeah, and about his um, past, yeah, you're suspicious about it, well, because of your own experience. Yeah. Well, I mean, in order to sum up what I'm critical of is that the model with which he wants to approach the contradictions between the religious and the secular is inadequate and that all what happened to him proves that. And therefore we have to have a paradigm change in terms of what we discussed here between the uh, you know, traditional and the critical theory. This shift has to take place and Metz has this, you know, and, and Kung has this, so there are people who have that, but the question is if the curia, the bureaucracy in Rome is willing to do that, and I think they will vote in another conservative fellow, you know. Well, one other thing I want to ask about, y the um, 
You said the council no longer has the power. Right, yeah. No. Although they, in some way, they must. If there's senality and incompetence, there must be some way, like you described, to force yeah. out the Pope, which obviously has happened. It's happened, yeah. But see, in the Second Vatican Council, they emphasize collegiality, and that means there was a Pope, and then was collegiality. That means the collegiality among the bishops. They are the council. But it didn't come through, you see. After the council, after they had opened up the windows, the wind blew through, uh, 60,000 priests left, got laicized, and 60,000 nuns and so on. So they became so frightened uh, under the next pope that they closed the windows again. And Ratzinger pays lip service to the council, but he closed the windows again. And that means also that the council, you know, remains weak as it was before. He just doesn't let him come up. Already that the Pope has to call in the council. So if we have to want to have a second uh, council in Jerusalem, that's what the um, push, what these people demand there, the reformers, uh -huh. a new council in Jerusalem. There was one in Jerusalem, the first one, and that would be the second one. So, and then, but also lay people would be in the council, not only clergy. Then the Orthodox Church has to be in there. You know, some of their bishops have to be in there. Otherwise, it's just a small Western council. The Protestants would have to be in there as well. They're Christians as well. So, in the last council, you know, the Orthodox was excluded. They were as of service. The Protestants were as of service, but they had no votes. The real Christian council would include the Orthodoxy, the Roman Catholicism, and all the Protestant groups. That would be a real council, right? But the there is the institutional means are not there in order to provide that. The Pope would have to call for a council, and he is wise enough not to counsel mm -hmm. one, not to call one. So we'll start this? Yeah. Good. Okay, so, so I will explain a little bit as this goes on there. Huh? Yeah. Every Pope prior to, well, John Paul XXIII every Pope after that, was that kind of a throwback, and I don't think that he was I think they're all in denial because the church has always been in a spiral since yeah. you know, Well, I think he was honest in himself. He really thought that this patriarch, patriarchalist, patristic model, you know, Augustine and Origins would really work and that would be the right way to approach modernity and he failed. You know. From this one should learn now and should uh, bring a paradigm change. And there are people who can help. It's King now. It's getting a little old King now, you know. and. And, uh, and Metz as well, but the 144 there in Germany, they were all younger. They are all in their 40s and so on, so they are young enough, you know, to, and they can listen to them. But will they, you know? That is bureaucracy then. Th that's how they can keep it conservative. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's what they will do. That's what I'm afraid of. Okay, do we have it here? Where are we? So ex uh, explain this a little bit. Rudy, you want to sit here? No, no, it's okay. okay. I can sit here. These are the old streetcars. My grandfather was a streetcar operator. When he started out, he still had a horse. But this is 1939. The streetcars were all electri electrified already. That is in Poland. I think, I think it is in Poland. In Warsaw, yeah, in the capital. Yeah, it's just in Warsaw. And this is the pianist. So that is the central figure famous Polish pianist, a radio pianist. He played on the radio. So therefore everybody knew him. They still have in the middle of Warsaw, Rudy, where the wall was for the ghetto. Yeah. They have a, a different color stone in the road going straight through, following every really? around every block where the wall was. Where the wall was. For uh -huh. the ghetto, right? For the ghetto, yeah. yeah. And there were two Warsaw uh, uh, upheavals, right? One right. was the Jewish people in the ghetto. Yeah. You'll see that. The other one was the Polish people, yep. made up people. Both were beaten down by the Germans. And the Russians who stood on the other side of the Vistula, that is the uh, river, didn't help. No. I asked uh, Katya why, but you didn't know. The Germans carpet bombed the whole city. They have an amazing museum for the Uprising Museum it's called in Warsaw where you take a 3D uh, swing 
Right, through the city of... I think that was right. the attack there, right? The German war stop, 1939. Yeah. Yeah. Bombardment of war. So that's two cars. Okay, so that's how the movie starts.
stupidest thing I've ever seen.
backlash against the unbelievable intellectual explosion of the Jewish people.
Is that a German? Hmm? Was he requesting this? No, they are Jews. They are in the ghetto. Yes. They gave them some self-administration in the ghettos, in their own culture and so on. The Alcestinrat, hmm? the Alcestinrat said, Jewish elders, yeah. with a Chaim Lunkowski. He just wanted the high value coin. Exactly.
commando. So we were sent there to pick up people. Yeah, don't put the ball. Uh, um, could do. Could also not be. And it's, you know, you go into a certain area, you hit maybe one family, and then that terrorizes everybody else. That's what we do in El Salvador when we have this uh, for training. We have these Einsatz commandos, which are the school assassins. Yeah, which are sent there, they kill family of five, ten people and then terrorize everybody else so that they don't unite and don't become socialists and don't become unions. And
after nine, do you want to be done? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all it is for today. And okay, see you again next Wednesday. Okay. You must be tired on this thing there. This chair. You are heroic, Alex. You are heroic. Okay, very good. Can we get it to the normal position? Just so I knew that one, <coughs> the situation they got, but I thought perhaps these were two undercover German agents watching, you know, when they were looking for whatever they were doing. No, they were. I thought maybe they were following. So they are the rich and they are the poor. See, right away it splits again. Oh, okay. Rich Jews and poor Jews. Okay, thanks for coming. See you a week. Did you get some cookies?